Welcome everybody to this wonderful talk, uh, again entitled Fighting for Freedom, Neocolonialism, Neocolonialism and the African Experience. Uh, we are just delighted to have Obianuju Ikocha, who mercifully goes by Uju, uh, to join us uh, today. So uh, I am Heidi Giebel. I teach philosophy here at the, the University of St. Thomas, and I am uh, an advisory board member of the Siena Symposium, uh, one of the co-sponsors of this event, uh, along with the Murphy Institute. Probably many of you are familiar with the, the Murphy Institute. In case you're not familiar with the Siena Symposium, uh, it started in 2000 uh, as a response to John Paul II's call in Evangelium Vitae in 1999 for an explicitly Christian feminism. Uh, and so we've been working on that since then. Uh, I guess I didn't join way back then, but, but a while ago. Uh, we've been working on that since then and continue to do so, uh, headed by our fearless leader, Deborah Savage. Uh, and, and we sponsor a Humanitarian Leadership Award, among other events. And, and again, so happy that we could co-sponsor this event along with the Murphy Institute. Uh, please note this event that we're having now is session one of two with Uju. So uh, today, uh, for this session, we can have live Q&A after the, the presentation that she pre-recorded uh, specifically for this event. Uh, she'll join us uh, live for Q&A now, uh, and then you'll get more details about the, the evening session as we go on, if, if you or a friend would like to join us for that as well. At this point, though, uh, before we turn it over uh, to Uju's presentation, I'd like to introduce Greg Sisk, a uh, faculty member at the law school and co-director of the Murphy Institute, and he's going to announce a special project that they have. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Greg Sisk, and along with Professor Dave Deevil, I am one of the co-directors of the Murphy Institute. Uh, and we are so delighted to support today's program and to have Obi Anuju Ikeocha with us. In addition to that welcome, the Murphy Institute wanted to take this opportunity to present to the university community and to the University of St. Thomas School of Law an original work of art commemorating an iconic figure for Africa and for all peoples. Uh, we in the Murphy Institute are sponsoring creation of artistic works that visually support a culture in which Catholic thought and the common good play a role in public policy. Uh, we've sponsored other artistic works or performances in the past, and we want to continue to make that a part of what we do, uh, especially if we can contribute to the university's adornment and also draw on local artists in doing so. Uh, we particularly want to add to the law school building and other university areas Catholic-centered art that reflects the universality of the church uh, and also points to particular parts of our mission. The icon that we are presenting today is of St. Josephine Bakita. She is a patron saint not only of Sudan, but of human trafficking survivors, a major issue today and one in which the Murphy Institute has and will continue to be involved. St. Josephine has been commemorated by Pope Benedict XVI in his encyclical Spe Salve as an example of the theological virtue of hope in action. Uh, and in addition, we were convinced that Providence was truly at work when we found that Uju is a great devotee of St. Josephine. Our local artist, Nick Markell, has presented, has prepared this drawing of what will be formed into an original icon uh, to be hung in a prominent place in the law school. Uh, and with that, let me introduce Dean Lisa Brabbit of the law school. Thank you, Professor Sisk. As chair of the art committee, I am very honored to accept this unique piece on behalf of the law school. Many of you are familiar with our mission, integrating faith and reason in the search for truth. In preparing for today, I came across a quote from President John Kennedy and he said, we must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda, it is truth. Artists are storytellers, and the creation of this icon seeks to tell a story, a story of truth. In the days and weeks and years ahead, it is now our responsibility to translate that story so that observers and listeners can fully receive this gift. Today's presentation is a perfect and fitting start. Our very deepest thanks to the Murphy Institute for this wonderful gift of art to the law school.
There we go. Uh, thank you, Greg and Lisa. Uh, and so now it is my honor to introduce Obianuju Ekocha to you. Uh, so she is an internationally acclaimed strategist, speaker, author, social activist, and documentary filmmaker. She was born and raised in southeastern Nigeria. Uju is the founder and president of Culture of Life Africa, an organization dedicated to the promotion of an authentic culture of life in Africa and beyond. She's the author of Target Africa, Ideological Neocolonialism of the 21st Century, published by Ignatius Press and now translated and republished in Spain and Saudi Arabia. And she's the executive producer of the award-winning documentary Strings Attached. Uju has advised many African, European, and North American legislators and political influencers on issues concerning women's health, youth, families, healthcare, foreign aid, education, and culture. She has also worked closely with religious leaders across the African continent and has co authored a number of pro life declarations with different African Catholic Episcopal conferences. She has planned, organized, and facilitated many major pro life conferences, strategic seminars, and March for Life rallies in various African countries. Uju has traveled the world extensively, speaking in 65 cities across 24 countries. She's been welcomed as a guest speaker at many high profile meetings and events, including policy briefing, briefings at the White House, US State Department, and a number of parliaments around the world, including the European Parliament. She also frequently addresses her concerns at various United Nations conferences and events. She has been featured by numerous broadcast networks, including BBC and Al Jazeera, where she has defended the sanctity and dignity of every life. Consistent with her love for the wonder of life, Uju also currently works as a specialist biomedical scientist in the United Kingdom. Prior to her current position, she was a medical laboratory scientist at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital. She holds a master's degree in biomedical science from the University of East London, and a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of Nigeria. Uh, please note that she had originally planned to join us here at St. Thomas in person. Uh, she was unable to do so due to travel restrictions uh, and she's grace, graciously recorded a presentation, especially for this event. And then again, she'll join us live for Q&A afterwards. Uh, so if you have questions, you can send them at any point through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Apologies, everyone. We've got a bit of a sound note. Give us one sec here. Greetings, everyone. My name is Obianu Juekocha, and I'm so very grateful to the Murphy Institute for inviting me to participate in this event. So thank you, Murphy Institute. Uh, I will be presenting today on the topic, Fighting for Freedom, Neocolonialism and African Experience. I know the term fighting for freedom is so commonly used, especially in our world today, that sometimes it almost seems emptied of meaning. But I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, we will see that if there was ever one time when it is really appropriate to use, it is when referring to something like neocolonialism. For the last uh, couple of years, I, a lot of my work has been based off of this topic, neocolonialism, and just observing what goes on between African nations and their Western counterparts or their Western donors. Uh, it's a topic that I find so fascinating, so profound, so disturbing in many regards, 
uh, that when I think about it, the only outcome I want now is just freedom. It's just really freedom. And I think really what needs to happen right now uh, is, is for, for, for us to fight for the freedom of the African people. Um, now, before I delve deeper into this topic, I would like to make a full disclosure <laughs> because I have made this presentation or similar presentation at different places and to different audiences. And what I find is that especially when it's to a hostile audience is that sometimes people want to throw me off and they say, why do you talk about Africa? You're not supposed to talk about Africa. Africa is not a country. It's, you know, it's not a country. How can one Nigerian woman be speaking about Af the entire Africa? Actually, I do have reason to believe that Africa can be discussed as an entire region or as one, as, as we say in this topic, as we do have one African experience with regards to certain things. But in full disclosure, I am Nigerian by birth and by nationality. And yes, I do understand the complexities that have to do with my continent. I know that it is a massive, massive continent with 55 different countries uh, where there are more than a billion people and there are thousands of languages spoken. There are thousands of ethnic groups uh, within the African continent. There are people who profess different creeds. Uh, and there, so there is really not one African culture. But I find from, from research, from data, from traveling, speaking to different people, being in, you know, being in different communities across the African continent, I do see that indeed there are common threads within culture whereby certain things, especially within the value system of those communities, they find it equally important. So something, for example, that is important to somebody in Ghana is equally could be equally important to someone in Uganda. And I find on certain issues particularly, yes, I can really refer to something as an African culture because we find it among, among people in different countries, no matter where you find them, no matter the language they're speaking, no matter the level of wealth. Also in, in those societies, there are certain things that people across the continent of Africa hold dear, hold important, hold as sacred. So yes, yes, in this regard, I can talk about an African experience. Now that's my that's my disclaimer and my full disclosure. So just. Moving on now to uh, the, the core of, of this topic, which is neocolonialism. I believe that in order for anybody to fully understand neocolonialism or the new colonialism, um, one has to at least have a basic understanding of the old colonialism or what happened in history. Um, the African continent in the from the 1800s up until I'd say even up until the 1960s, uh, the African continent was colonized. So that is the original colonialism, if you like, the old colonialism that then came before this thing we are now going to understand today, which is the new colonialism or the neo-colonialism. Uh, the reality of what happened at the time, uh, the colonialism of the 20th century, as I have it here, is that the several Western countries or Western superpowers gathered together and uh, took a map of the of what is what we now understand as the African continent and they divided it into various sections and various countries and each of those chunks of the continent of Africa uh, was given to an, a superpower western superpower so we had uh, the colonials from Great Britain and, and from France who got like large chunks of our continent. There were also other colonials who were from uh, Portugal and Spain and Belgium. Uh, Italy as well. A lot of people don't don't know that Italy, in fact, did get some countries that they colonized in African continent and Germany uh, that we so rarely hear about simply because by 1914, during the First World War, uh, 
the Germans were sort of ousted out of Africa. So they had to let go, they had to leave the countries where they were colonizing because they fell out with the superpowers. So in other words, everything that was happening in and around Africa uh, was really most importantly determined by our colonial masters. They were the ones who were leading us, they were determining what will happen in, in each African country or which, whichever country that is annexed to them. Um, and, and so this was how they, they led the African people up until what we'll call the wave of independence in Africa. And that happened uh, starting from the very late 1950s. So by 1960s, uh, the, a lot of or most of the African countries had gained their independence. That is the reality of Africa as far as colonialism, the old colonialism is concerned. But talking today about the what what is what goes on on the African continent today, the independent Africa, uh, there there are several current dynamics that one has to understand or consider, even before you consider then the neocolonialism, because the neocolonialism is happening and continues to happen on the background or the backdrop of what is our reality today. That the African continent, one cannot talk about the African continent or the various African countries within the continent without considering all the different moving parts which will include things that have to do with the economy. As people know, a lot of our African countries are struggling from the point of view of economy. Uh, we have issues that have to do with politics and with so, many, so many considerations there and all of that that will affect the people within those countries. Uh, there are issues of security. People who are listening to international news will know that in a country like mine, Nigeria, uh, there have been problems of terrorism. There are other African countries as well where security has really been a real concern, a real problem uh, for the people. There are, consider there are considerations of infrastructure that we people have to make when thinking of Africa. And of course, development, which is a recurring theme every time nations gather, they are talking about how can the African countries become more developed. So development is just a huge consideration. Um, and also healthcare. You know, when we talk about uh, epidemics, even before the one we've seen now, the pandemic we've just currently seen around the world. But but before, whenever anybody talks about epidemic, I think people will, will sort of consider Africa when you think of Ebola, when you think of uh, the cholera, when you think of even the HIV AIDS. One's mind will go to Africa, and it, it's really at that point that one would see, uh, see, I think, a lot of the inadequacies within African countries. And so each of these considerations, the economy, the politics of the people, the infrastructure, the security issues and challenges, um, each of them will present a weakness within the various African countries. So it's really on this backdrop of all these vulnerabilities that African countries have and experience that these people come in, these donors, particularly our Western donors, who come to us just looking like they're bearing gifts and freebies that look so good, especially to our African leaders, to the point that they have almost an open door policy to, to the donors that, that approach the various African countries. The donors are coming as nations. They are sometimes organizations, NGOs. Uh, then we also find a lot of private foundations, especially in more recent times, we have these various foundations. Uh, and Africa seems to be the preferred destination all the time for, for anyone who wants to do good. Um, and I know that from, from one point of view, one would say, well, yeah, it's the intentions are very good. They, they want to see an end to suffering in Africa. They want to help the people of Africa. Um, but in some regards, especially in more recent times, this is what I have come to observe. This is what we have, we have seen in, in just the shift that is happening within these relationships between donor and recipient that, in fact, there is need to question exactly what is going on. Is it philanthropy or is it neocolonialism? Let's find out. So this is what the power imbalance, the reality of the power imbalance between the Western donor and the African recipient. What we find is that the, it, the African countries have reached such a point of high dependence 
on the donor. The donors have been have been coming to Africa and without any real plan of, of leaving. It, it's, it's almost as if they, they have come into African continent and they give money and they give aid. And each year we find even the data shows that the aid being given keeps increasing year on year. There is no real end to it. And there is even no real uh, vision by both the donor and the recipient of how this should come to an end of how where are we going how how will we see an end to this dependency so we find this uh, situation where the african countries a lot of them uh, in many ways are now very much dependent on on the donor's funding uh, the, and so the donor now sits in a very powerful position where they are the ones who are defining exactly what they will be donating to exactly not just what they'll be donating to but what projects will then be prioritized uh, in the various african countries they are the ones making the determinations of the funding they are the ones who then expect a certain level of compliance by the recipient, the African recipient, uh, and any reluctance or refusal uh, by an African country, it meets with zero tolerance. So we find situations where, say, for example, an African leader says, uh, actually, we don't want funding on this particular thing, uh, especially when it, when it has to do with issues that are that are a bit touchy or a bit difficult subjects. Uh, one particular African president at one point in time had said uh, that we African countries don't want any funding for condoms. This was during the uh, the peak of the HIV uh, pandemic at the time or HIV epidemic. Um, and the backlash that came to that president, that particular African leader, was unbelievable what was unleashed upon him and how these Western donors who were who initially came and said, we came to help. But when this president then said, oh, no, I want my country to choose a path where we are learning more about abstinence and fidelity, oh, my goodness, there was a, a huge campaign against him. Uh, and they got, uh, you know, there was so much pushback that I believe just over time, I think he kind of gave up, gave up on, on that particular interest of his where, where he didn't want his country dependent on condoms, for example. So it, there is no room at all in the minds of our donors. Uh, we've come to see that for any refusal or any challenge or any kind of questioning. Uh, there is also very strong criticism, like in the case of that particular African leader. Uh, once, you know, somebody doesn't want to comply. Uh, and, and so this is what I find has now resulted in the new colonialism. Um, this has become the gateway, if you like, to the 21st century colonialism, which is you know in many ways is different than what happens in the 20th century, but in some ways as well there are similarities of how Western superpowers, which is now not only countries but also single individuals who have enough wealth to kind of force their way, they have managed to you know surround the African continent, and it is really what they want. Uh, that is now being done. They are pushing through policies. They are pushing through their way of life. They are pushing through their own views and values. And in many ways, they are then forcing back uh, the African people who already have their value system. They have their culture. They have their traditions. They have things that they hold their beliefs that they hold their well, the donor is really the master. So this is the colonialism of the 21st uh, century. So the, what we find now looking, going down to look at data, we've, what I, I have observed and what is really the reality, as you would see in a minute, is that there has been a visible shift. Now, this is a graph that I like to refer to because it illustrates quite perfectly and quite clearly 
the shift that has happened in the mindset of Africa's donors when it comes to, to aid. This is uh, data that has come from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an organization that tracks aid, uh, showing exactly what happened with the official development assistance, which is another way of saying humanitarian aid. And if one looks at the graph, you can see what happened uh, with the various things. You can see education, healthcare, uh, water and sanitation, Population programs, though, is the one that fascinates me the most because population programs um, is this red mark. You can see that it, uh, in 1996, when this, from when this data um, started, that it was really the least of what was given or what was allocated. So the least was given to population programs. Um, and, and there were more uh, humanitarian assistance given to things like healthcare and water and sanitation and uh, even education uh, within Africa. But then the rent starts to rise. And around the time when there was the economic recession, especially within Western countries, Everything was kind of coming down 2007, 2008, 2009. The less uh, assistance was being given, less ODA was being given, but population program kept going up. So the money, in other words, that was being put by Africa's Western donors towards Africa uh, had no reversal when it came to population program. It just kept giving us, giving us more and more and more um things that have to do with population programs. So to understand this a bit more, let's just unpack a bit what the population programs entailed or what it included. So aid for population programs would include all aspects of the so-called SRHR, the sexual and reproductive health and rights. And this would be things that have to do with giving contraception, uh, providing condoms, uh, especially when one looks at what happened with HIV. So condoms be became a really huge aspect uh, of humanitarian aid it has to do with the, the so-called um, comprehensive sexuality education for children, uh, whereby children are being exposed to these, um, I, I think, highly inappropriate and highly graphic sort of, you know, education on, on human sexuality. And they try to un universalize that and try to globalize it and brought to African schools um, these kinds of things that even African parents found quite outrageous. And even up to now, we are still in these fights um, because there is so much funding uh, being put behind this. There is now so much push at all levels in various African communities to force this into African schools. And of course, uh, everything that has to do with abortion. So giving aid to um, to, to organizations that, that have to do with the promotion or the providing of abortion, organizations like the International Planned Parenthood Federation, Marie Stokes International, DKT International, these organizations now could gain access to money that could have gone to other forms of humanitarian assistance. So the Western countries who gathered together as Africa's donors then decided that population program is something that deserves more uh, money and more assistance than, ex ex you know, water and sanitation, for example, or education or health care. So from the graph that I showed you, you would see that whereas everything else over the years um, have been reduced in, in the aid that we get in those aspects, in, in many regards, but not for population programs. We keep getting more and more to the point that um, by the end of that data, which was over this 16 year period, by the year 2013, the highest aid that Africa was getting uh, on the social, the social um, sector was for population programs. So they're giving us more money for con contraception and condoms and abortion and comprehensive sexuality education for our children than they are giving us for real education, for real health care, uh, for uh, water and sanitation for communities that don't have access to basic needs like that and infrastructure. Uh, so this is really a shift, a radical shift, if I can put it that way, 
in the mindset of African Western donors, and it is what has now set the tone for what we find now uh, we, when it comes to the international community, when it comes to organizations like the United Nations, where countries gather together. It's, you, you know, whenever we hear our Western donors speaking, you can see that they keep pushing these priorities that they come, they come to us with, the population program, which they've shown it, they've shown their what they think about it in the way they are giving money, but they're ready to go beyond just giving money and resources to promote these issues. Uh, they are now even going as far as pushing policy, pushing for changes, pushing for countries with, you know, within Africa to change their laws. So this, you know, this is what we have found. But in reality, when you are looking at the donor's will, what I like to call the reality of the donor's will versus the recipient's way, is that we find, uh, uh, you know, an organization or an initiative like Condomize, which was, pr you know, promoted by the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, whereby they're sharing hundreds of thousands of condoms uh, across different African communities. Uh, for example, this party that they, that they had in 2014 uh, in an African country where they said they shared more than 100,000 condoms in one single party. But the reality of what I find on ground is that you go to African communities and you find young people who are carrying placards and saying, please help us with education. We don't want condoms. You find places where Western donors drop you know, millions and millions of condoms, what millions of dollars, and yet nobody wants them. These are things that we've seen on the ground. Uh, there are places where, for example, contraception programs um, have been put in place by Western donors, and yet at the end of the day, nobody is using those services, nobody is frequenting it. Sometimes they give African women in various places um, contraceptive drugs and devices, and you find that our discontinuation rate remains very high. Women may accept these contraceptives, um, but then after a short while, they discontinue it or they try to, to take it out or remove it for, for the ones that are long-term uh, uh, contraceptive devices. And yet the donors come back, instead of them to understand that within these communities, these are things that people do not consider priority. Uh, but instead of them to do that, they, they still give even more money for the same things, just hoping to achieve a different uh, outcome at the end of the day. So the reality of the donor's will versus the recipient's way. Uh, there was a program uh, that was uh, hosted a couple of years ago by several Western countries. They called it the Staff Project Safe Abortion Action Fund. So it was uh, put together by the International Planned Parenthood Federation, but uh, the funding really came from Western nations like the United Kingdom, like the Netherlands. You know, there were all these countries that gathered together and put large amount of money into this um, particular program that has to do with the promotion of abortion in African countries. You can see the website they did. They put a nice looking African woman on that website. However, the reality that we find on ground again is you go into communities and you find African women in villages, towns and cities alike saying, we don't want abortion. We don't give us abortion, please. We want health care. We want our children to be able to go to school. We want to be able to have drinking water uh, close by to our home so that we don't drink water that will kill us. Uh, these, are, these are the things that we find on ground and the donors probably know that because there has been so much failure and so much rejection and objections to all these things that they are bringing to African countries and you know various communities. And yet each time they come, they give us more. And so you find yourself with a graph that looks like the one we just saw where whereby less money is being given for education, less money is being given for water and sanitation, uh, and yet more money is being put into what they're calling population programs. Um, that, is, that is it, the reality of the donor's way or the donor's will versus the recipient's way. Now, let's look at abortion and what, the, what I call the landscape of abortion, where all these green parts, uh, places where you have abortion, legalized abortion, or what 
people call abortion on demand. In Africa, a lot of people don't realize it, but most of the African countries, remember how I spoke about there are various African countries, there's 55 African countries. Uh, out of all those countries in Africa, it is only four countries that actually have what you will consider as abortion on demand. Uh, and this will be South Africa, Tunisia, Cape Verde, and Mozambique. Most of the other African countries uh, have all kinds of restrictions against abortion. So I'd say about 80% of the African countries still remain by policy and by law pro-life, if you like. So people are against abortion or the governments are against abortion. The laws reflect that, the policies reflect that. Uh, and, and then in reality as well, what people think on ground uh, is that the people themselves are largely pro-life because people say, well, you know, even if a country might not have legal abortion, maybe the people in that country would want legal abortion. So if you look at the data, in 2014, uh, Pew Research had a very robust survey where, whereby people were asked various questions in different countries around the world. So I just picked uh, some of the African countries where people were questioned on this particular issue of abortion. And the question was, uh, do you find abortion morally acceptable or morally unacceptable? And it is quite telling to, to, to realize, but not shocking at all to me, but really quite telling uh, that most of the respondents in the African countries, upwards of 80%, and in some countries, up to 90%, people were saying that they are against abortion. Uh, for South Africa, that has had legal, legalized abortion for the past 20-something years, uh, even more than 60% of the people who were questioned said that they find abortion morally unacceptable. So the African people themselves uh, are so against abortion and so resistant to the idea of legalized abortion that, in fact, it then is reflected in our reality and our policy. And yet, whenever the donors come, the donors overlook uh, the, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the African public who are against abortion and, and who are against the legalization of abortion. And yet they put more money into the hands of Western organizations that are abortion providers uh, who are running around the African continent trying to push the issue, trying to lobby the issue for the issue, trying to force uh, public, uh, you know, public opinion on the issue of abortion. And on, it's very unfortunate because whenever I go to an African country, it, you know, one would be so saddened to see that the people themselves, the, the general population themselves, are saying, we don't want all these things that, that these Western donors are, are trying to give us, we don't want it. So you, I find situations where women are coming out with placards for, you know, we, we host an event and women are coming out with placards, people are, are writing things at home and, and making these, these placards at home and saying we don't want abortion, we know that abortion hurts women, we want to protect our unborn children, these children are important to us, these are uh, you know, within our culture, we cannot kill, we don't want to kill our children. So there are all these things I've heard um, women talk about and, and, and families talk about and even men talk about. But then you turn around and you find a Western country uh, that completely ignores them, a Western country that completely just looks the other way and that, that just goes straight to an abortion organization and gives them money and says, go in and, and do some work in Africa. You find an organization like Center for Reproductive Rights. I mean, obviously, there's so many examples that I can share with you of what we've seen over the years and some of the Western organizations who come directly from their Western, you know, country offices and, and install themselves uh, into African societies, uh, build their, their offices in, in African capitals, and then try to, from that point, affect everything that goes on in that country. So I give you an example of Center for Reproductive Rights, which I know for an American audience, most of you probably would have heard of the Center for Reproductive Rights. It is an American organization. Uh, they, they are very, very active in DC, and I think the headquarters um, is in New York. 
And in America, you find them that they are, you know, putting a lot of money because they have tons of funding, uh, uh, you know, pushing all kinds of things at your Supreme Court. They are pushing things uh, within uh, at local levels, at your legislators and, and such. They are there on, you know, social media and they are there even in mainstream media trying to affect and influence things, even though, uh, of course, we know what happens at that level in most Western countries. But in Africa, the situation is different, that uh, the, the public sentiment is that abortion is terrible and people don't want it. So what the Center for Reproductive Rights has done is that um, the, this particular specific example is that they came to Kenya uh, a couple of years ago. This was, I think, back in 2015. They picked a case, uh, went to court with it. They put in so much money and uh, you know, encourage this woman who had an illegal abortion and whose daughter uh, having an illegal abortion got then, I think she had a problem. Uh, so they, they took this girl and used her as, uh, you know, the point of judicial activism. They went to court against the Kenyan health ministry and the Kenyan government, and they went all the way to the high court, the highest court in the land. Uh, mind you, this is an American organization with all their funding and all their money. They're able to push uh, an African country or the health ministry of an African country to the point where they get to the highest court and they win a case where, whereby abortion is still not legal in, in Kenya, but then the court then told the health ministry that they have to have a handbook uh, that is available that, that describes how to perform abortions. And so I find it quite interesting that the Center for the Productive Rights then goes back on their website and they are celebrating what happened, uh, how they won this uh, legal battle in Kenya. Uh, and they, they call it, they call it a, how they, they won a victory, a major victory for Africa, abortion rights in Africa, even though this happened in the one single African country, this is something that shows you exactly how they are thinking. Um, this is judicial activism. It is the result, I think, of the kind of funding that has come from Western donors who have then put money into the hands of abortion organizations and then sent them into Africa to wreak havoc and to kind of challenge the system that we have there uh, that very much connect to views, people's views, deeply held views and values that have to do with um, the promotion of life. Uh, so this is just one example. But also, even in more recent times, um, I can so many things that I can talk about whereby we find our Western donors are, are sort of seeing themselves as the stakeholders, they are major influencers of, of policy in Africa. And it's only because they come with funding. It's only because of the kind of money they come with. There's, you know, uh, in Africa, if someone comes with millions of dollars, it is something that can, in, in fact, eventually influence policy, if nothing else, even if not public sentiment. But they can push our government. They can go to court against our government. They can... Uh, you know, they can push our legislators and lobby them so heavily. That is neocolonialism. That's, that's really a Western force having their way and determining exactly where an African nation will go, even if it's against the will of the people, the very obvious will of the people. So even in more recent times, I'll find what happened with um, what has happened with COVID, the COVID pandemic during this period, uh, we have had uh, the difficulties that people have experienced in, in various countries, including the West. This is something that affected Western countries as well as, as African countries. So uh, it was really towards the beginning of the COVID pandemic that we started hearing about this thing called essential health care services. And we were all very shocked uh, to find that uh, people who, uh, uh, you know, the abortion movement, even in the, in the West, one of the first things they did was trying to establish and push for abortion to be seen or considered as a, a an essential health care. The same thing was extended to Africa for those who didn't follow what was going on on the, you know among the African countries and uh, within the international community is that uh, at places like the United Nations, African countries were being pushed 
towards this idea that abortion is in fact uh, uh, an essential healthcare, in as much as people within African co the African continent have continued to reject abortion, even though people have continued to say they find it, you know, morally unacceptable, they find it reprehensible, they find it against their values and, and their views. But then imagine that we then find ourselves in this difficult position of the pandemic, and then the international community is nudging African countries um, to accept the fact that abortion is an important uh, part of health care, uh, given that they failed on so many occasions. So, of course, in this very uh, unprecedented case of the pandemic, the, the abortion movement found it as a, a huge opening. And so we found that even when talking about humanitarian aid, there were so many um, instances and several cases where uh, things like food relief, you know, for food, uh, getting aid to, to countries and communities where people were lacking so much given what happened with the pandemic, places where people are having dire difficulties and, and very uh, severe backlash of the you know, everything that came with the pandemic, not just the pandemic itself, but the fact that, that businesses were stopped and, and you know, uh, food chains were cut and, and many countries came to a crashing halt in the first couple of months. There were parts of Africa where people didn't even have any food to eat because uh, food chains and food, you know, food supply chains were, were completely uh, cut off. So, at that point where the international community was gathering to make sure that Africa had a soft landing or a softer landing and that we don't suffer, you know, as much as we possibly could, uh, given the already difficult situation in, in those different African countries, uh, we then started hearing um, that abortion was being forced into the matter that in some resolutions, sexual and reproductive health and rights, which would include abortion, was being pushed uh, by several people, especially from the quarters of those who were, uh, you, you could call the Western donors. And um, even in, in on ground, in, in several cases where I uh, spoke to people and did some research, you found that in countries like Kenya, Malawi, and Namibia, even they went as far as trying to introduce uh, you know, in, in by stilt or by, by force, um, bills, sexual and reproductive uh, bills or reproductive health bills or even directly abortion bills uh, onto those uh, uh, parliaments. So in other words, trying to get abortion legalized using the cover of the pandemic, given that with what has happened, uh, and especially the, the very first half of uh, the, the pandemic, there were countries where people were not even thinking of anything. I mean, people were trying to survive, people were losing employment, you know, all kinds of things were happening, all challenges that people were finding within their communities. And so it would have been easy to try to force abortion through while nobody was looking. And that was exactly how it happened in some of the African countries. Um, but fortunately, uh, things, you know, fortunately, there, there was a good response against uh, these attempts, and so, uh, of course, those attempts failed, but it goes to show the mindset within uh, the Western colonial influencers, the new colonial influencers who now are trying to push Africa towards certain issues, especially because they have the donor power, they have the money, they have uh, the what it takes to influence policy, and so they, they keep pushing us at that point. Um, now, the donor is really the master, if you think about it that way. The donor is the master. We, we, you know, what I, what, I, what I find is that with this kind of relationship where they are able to come in whenever they want, there is like an open door policy, be it out, you know, during the pandemic, be it during normal times that our donors are able to walk into a, a, an African government office or a ministry or, you know, even a parliament and they are demanding change, they're demanding a shift, given that they have the money. But if you remember, the donors, first of all, come to us like they're just there to help us. They are there, you know, we have this money and this resource, uh, this resource if you want it. But then they quickly shift 
from becoming just a donor to the master, there is a lot of paternalism that goes into it where they're thinking like the original uh, colonials that we know what is best these people and that's the attitude i think that's the first attitude in the mind of the uh, the neo colonial master if you like they 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 come to us with a kind of attitude of cultural imperialism and so this is the neo colonialism the ideological neo colonialism that we are seeing these days but i find that there is even something much more sinister in their attitude uh, to us especially after having observed what happened, um, how they tried to push abortion upon African countries during the pandemic, I think uh, that we've reached that point where Africa's, a lot of Africa's Western donors have come with an attitude of supremacy. No, not white supremacy, but what I call ideological supremacy, where they are really thinking that they, we are superior. And so because we are superior, our position is, the, is kind of much more on a moral high ground. And the only acceptable outcome and the only acceptable expectation is that our African recipients should do exactly what we want. That is supremacy, that is ideological supremacy. And we find that that is exactly uh, where they, a lot of the African countries find themselves. Uh, there is a really notable Nigerian um, author who uh, you know, wrote a lot of uh, important uh, literature books called, who, his name is Chinua Achebe. He has a quote that I love to go back to all the time, especially when I think about neocolonialism. And the fact that it is happening now and many of the things that I present to people are things that people say we may have suspected, but we never even knew, we never heard some of the data, they may never even have heard it. And so I think that this is going on even at this, you know, in a, this our era of a high information era. And yet it's going almost unnoticed without any outrage, without any uh, you know, without any coverage whatsoever. Chinua Achebe said that until the lions have their own historians, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Meaning that, uh, you know, a lot of what is going on, you know, some of it has not been recorded. And then those who are meant to record it, if we don't begin to record it now, in history, later on, down the line, uh, it, it may just be that our Western uh, donors will then be the ones who are glorified. And for some of the outrageous things that they've tried to force upon us, uh, the African countries may, may never really, may never really even be acknowledged, may never really even be exposed. So this is why I do what I do. Uh, and, and one of the most recent uh, and important relevant examples is what happened uh, in America in the last few months with the change of administration, uh, that uh, the there was a Mexico City policy which was in place from the previous administration and from other conservative administrations as well. So the Mexico, the Mexico City policy is uh, this policy within the United States uh, through the executive arm that ensures that the taxpayer, the American taxpayer is not funding abortion organizations in their international work. And it was back in with the new administration in January that the Mexico City policy was completely overturned. So money then started flowing into the hands of abortion organizations who come to African countries and who go to other parts of the developing world. So I just thought uh, about this Shinra Achebe's uh, powerful quote about the lions getting their own historians, keeping account of what is going on, taking records of what happens in the present time for the sake of history, just to make sure that history does not end up glorifying the hunter. Uh, and I, I made a video. I, I, you know, we decided to collect videos from various African countries, from different people in various walks of life about what people thought about just this latest uh, neo-colonial move um, that that is you know that has come from the United States uh, via its newest administration, and um, it's really I think it really encapsulates just this thought of free, fighting for freedom. You would see exactly how the African people feel about 
you know, what, when the when our donor, or when a Western donor comes in and they're so insistent and they are so particular about prioritizing something that is not that important or is not even important at all to the African uh, recipient. So I hope that this is a, a good enough note to end on. It's just to share with you this video. Uh, it's a 15 minute video, so bear with me. It's a, a, you know, just uh, showing you exactly how the Africans feel. So thank you very much. appeal to Joe Biden, please do not, do not, do not sponsor abortion in Africa. And I would like to use this opportunity to plead with the incoming U.S. President Joe Biden not to sponsor abortion in Africa. We all deserve the right to live. I stand against the funding of abortion in Africa. Life or death, I choose life. My name is Benson and I'm a cinematographer. I stand against the funding of abortions in Africa. What if you weren't given the chance to live? What if I was aborted? I wouldn't be here making this video. My name is Tumei and I stand against abortions in Africa. The then newly elected president of the United States, President Donald Trump, reinstated the Mexico City policy. Now, what this meant at the time was that the United States government, through its executive arm, was to stop funding any organizations that were either promoting or providing abortion in their international work. And in the same way, the administration did go ahead to launch the protection of life in global health assistance and in that way ensured that the United States taxpayers were definitely not paying for any abortions overseas. This became of course a sticking point for abortion activists and for you know uh, Western leaders and for everyone who wanted abortion promoted or pro uh, propagated, especially in the developing world. This became a campaign issue for people within the Democratic Party. It became a, a talking point even at the European Union. We saw people reacting to it. We saw Western leaders reacting to it. We saw them even organizing all kinds of fundraisers back then in 2017 to fill in the gaps that were being left by the United States. States. Now, mind you, this particular banning of American taxpayer funding going to international abortion organizations was only affecting organizations that definitely insisted that they were going to continue to promote abortion in their work. I am talking about organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation that was founded by the American eugenicist, racist Margaret Sanger. I am talking about an organization like Marie Stokes International that was founded by the Scottish racist eugenicist Marie Stokes. I am talking about an organization like DKT International that was founded by the American pillar of the porn industry, Phil Harvey himself. Now, these were the kinds of organizations that were affected by the deprivation of this American funding. But what we saw, the reaction we saw, uh, was quite shocking to me, especially as an African, because the, back in Africa, of course, people were happy at the time. The, all the people who I spoke to who knew about this particular banning of abo uh, funding for abortion organizations, they were actually very happy that the United States was finally recognizing the culture of most of the African people, the desire of most of the African people, uh, the consensus that we have have across the different African countries. People were rejoicing over that. But where we found people actually uh, tying themselves into knots over uh, this particular ban of abortion funding was really in the West. 
So what then happened in the United States, as can be expected, is that within the Democratic Party, this then became a real campaign issue, whereby candidates were actually making campaign promises, yes, campaign promises, to resume the funding of abortions overseas. This was quite astounding and surprising to me as an African, just watching the Democrats fall over themselves, uh, promising to sponsor also abortion organizations and to uh, fund abortion organizations in the important work in the developing world. We even heard during a particular event that was organized by, the, by Planned Parenthood in the summer of 2019, we heard the then candidate Joe Biden make this particular promise. We have over $8 billion in health care assistance around the world, and he's trying to apply Mexico City standards to that. It's dead wrong. People are dying around the world. We are their saviors around the world. You are the ones who are providing for all of the health care for poor women in ways that nobody else has been able to. That's why Barack and I fought so hard to continue to see your funding. No, but I really mean it. I think you underestimate the impact you have beyond access access to choice and access to the Supreme Court decisions. What an incredible clip to watch. So watching this man who is praising the work of Planned Parenthood and talking about getting rid of the Mexico City policy altogether and talking about himself and his pro-abortion pairs as being the saviors of the people in the developing world, talking about funding abortions overseas. This I find quite horrifying, to be honest, because I know that what exactly that means, that this man now being the newly elected president of the United States then means that money will go into the pockets of organizations that are in fact abortion giants like International Planned Parenthood Federation, Mary Stokes International, DKT International, that they will now go with a strong mandate and fortified mandate by the United States being funded by the enormous wealth of the United States to then go into the developing world, the world of the poor essentially, to promote, to propagate and to provide abortions. This means the elimination of my people. This this means the death and killing of the most innocent of the African unborn babies. I eagerly waited for his team to put out, as is normally the case, the executive, the list of executive orders that were going to be dealt with. And here is what I saw right there in the list uh, on the health care. Uh, of course, the Biden uh, incoming Biden administration had clearly written out that they were going to get rid of the Mexico City policy, so the repeal of the Mexico City policy. And of course, I did the thing that came most naturally to me, I sent word home. I wanted to ask my brothers and sisters and my dear friends who are in different African countries exactly how they feel about the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, the most powerful country in the world, coming into African countries and funding abortion organizations. And here is what people told me. This is a request, actually a plea, to the incoming American president, Joe Biden, to please not fund abortion in African countries. Please, we do not need funding for abortion. In my culture, we support life from the beginning till the end. I'm against abortion because abortion is about killing innocent babies in the womb of their mothers. And I'm also against funding of abortion in Africa by any foreign country. So please stop funding abortion. Thank you. I am an African and an African woman. I do not believe in taking lives, destroying it, nor killing it. We do not need abortion. Why must abortion be funded and given priority in my country? I am here to tell you and to appeal to you that we do not want it. We stand against it and we do not believe in it. Hello everyone, my name is Kanae Daniela and I'm a Ugandan and um, an African, yes, an African woman. This is basically a clarion call to the US president not to fund abortion organizations or companies because the African problem cannot be solved by giving money to remove children. Please, we don't want 
abortion clinics here and we are pleading on the incoming government to not fund abortion in Africa. This message is to the incoming American government. Africa does not want abortion. We do not want abortion. I do not want abortion for my Uganda. We do not want your government funding any abortion organizations in Uganda. Africa intends to be abortion free. Abortion is mother. Abortion is literally mother. Abortion is murder. And funding it makes you an accessory. Please, don't do it. Quoi qu'il en soit, l'avortement n'a jamais été une solution. Non, c'est toujours un problème. L'avortement est un crime. Les jeunes Africains n'ont pas besoin de l'avortement. Alors, nous disons non. Nous ne voulons pas le financement de l'avortement en Afrique. And this is a message to the American government. Please, we don't want funding, any form of funding for abortion. We are not interested. It's not our priority. I do not want the United States of America, this present government, to fund abortions in Africa. We've never needed abortions and we do not want them. And we do not want USA to fund abortions in Africa. We do not want abortions in Nigeria. We do not want abortions in Africa. And we do not want the American government to fund abortions in Africa. This is an appeal to the US government not to fund abortion in the African states. Majorly because the African community is built on the following principles. The sanctity of life, equal dignity for all, protecting the weak and the vulnerable. Since the right to life is inherent, I believe the same should be accorded to the unborn child. The energy should be diverted to other sectors of Africa that we need to develop. So therefore, protect the unborn child. I cannot understand why other foreign countries are in support of funding abortion in Africa. When in Africa here, there are a lot of developments that needs to be done, and they are not done. So I am not in support of funding abortion in Africa. So please stop funding abortion in Africa. Thank you. I am a pure African woman. I don't support the funding of abortion in Africa. I must not strive to only make abortion illegal in Africa, but to make it unthinkable. Children walking homelessly on street, youth drop out of school, people dying of hunger every day, children being abused and used as slaves in their homes. These are the things we need funds on, but not abortion. God will never bless a nation that destroy its children. We Africans don't need force and abortion, but funds to help the needy, the poor, the weak, the sick, and the homeless. I believe that we have more urgent needs and sectors that need to be developed, like healthcare, infrastructure, and your education, or unemployment among our youth. So it's my appeal, therefore, to the US government that instead of supporting abortion and funding it, they should direct their efforts to get into these sectors. That being said, stand for the unborn child. Nous avons besoin de d'eau potable. Nous avons besoin d'éducation. Nous avons besoin de la bonne gouvernance. L'avortement n'est pas un problème africain. Par contre, aider les Africains à mieux vivre, ça passe par l'accès à l'eau potable, ça passe par une bonne éducation, l'accès à l'éducation, ça passe par une bonne gouvernance. S'il vous plaît, à vous qui êtes responsable de l'administration américaine, nous vous prions, nous vous supplions de ne pas financer les programmes d'avortement en Afrique. Nous avons des problèmes réels en Afrique et ce n'est pas l'avortement. Merci. I'd like to appeal to the incoming administration in the U.S. to consider channeling their funds to areas such as education, infrastructure, vocational training. Those areas would help better the quality of life of Nigerians and Africans as a whole. Abortion is a violation of the basic human right of that unborn child, and it's illegal in Nigeria. So please consider channeling these funds 
to much more fruitful areas. We need water in our village. We need food. We need hospital. So I need to go to school because I'm seeing it. I'm six months. I don't need. We don't need abortion. We do not need abortion. Africa does not need abortion. Funding abortion in Africa may sound like a good idea, but it's not. Save life, don't kill us. Five things Nigeria needs more than abortions. Poverty alleviation, employment, education, electricity, and better infrastructure. Please help us. Don't kill us. There you have it. Help us. Don't kill us. This is the voice that is resounding across the continent of Africa. This is the cry that you would hear across the different African countries. This is the unified cry that is in the hearts of the people in the various African communities. People who know all the needs within their communities. People who know the devastating effects abortion will have on their communities. People, in fact, who reject abortion from the point of view of their cultural heritage and their faith. The Africans do not want abortion in different ways at different times, given different opportunities. Anytime the Africans are asked, the answer is always unanimous. We do not want abortion. The question now is this, will President Joe Biden listen to us? Will he recognize the voice of the African people? Will he respect the cries of the heart of the ordinary African person? Or will he just be the new colonial master like many other Western leaders? Will he be the one to come in to force his own ideas and ideologies in the world of the poor? I hope not. Please, President Joe Biden, listen to the voice of the Africans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uju, for sharing that presentation and that beautiful video with us. We've got just about 15 minutes left uh, for questions, and we do have, have several. We'll see how many we can get to. Uh, first, a, a big picture question for you, Uju. Uh, someone asks, how do Africans resist the influence of Western ideologies uh, when they're imposed as this kind of neo-colonialism? Yeah, so we, it, well, it depends on the country, right? But what I find from country to country is that people can still organize in a similar way as people do organize in the West. So we have various channels. We still have ways of approaching our lawmakers. So you find in some countries where they are organized enough, sometimes people can form themselves into groups and approach their lawmakers. But you must also understand that we are nowhere near uh, any of the Western countries, how you have people are so organized in the US, you know, ways to get to your congressman or woman. You have organizations that have that are able to raise enough funds to do that all through the year. So in African countries, you find it very difficult to find a dedicated pro-life organization, for example. So many times people go through the, say, for example, the church, because the church can put out an announcement. Uh, but it's almost as if we're playing catch up, because those who are promoting the opposite are there 12 months in a year. In fact, there is something that, um, that I, I usually like to tell people as an anecdote, anytime I go to an African country and I'm staying in a hotel, you find if you are staying in a good hotel, there are people that I know I will find that all the time. And those are American uh, NGO workers. Uh, there was a time I was uh, just once, I was staying at the Hilton in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. It was a shock. There was a big party and I was asking people working in the Hilton, what's going on? Oh, it's people working in USAID. This was a school night. So these are people who come directly from the US. They are living in, in an African country. It's their job. And it's not only that it's their job, it's their highly paid job to do this and achieve this 
all year round. So if you think of what has happened, for example, in Argentina, just how abortion came to be passed there, just looking at the background, there are Western NGOs who are there 12 months of the year. Same with us. Um, so people can still do a counter organization, but it's not always easy. And we're not always as resoundingly successful, if you see what I mean. So uh, we, we can still work our best. And, and the churches, the churches, you can't, I can't overemphasize what they do. The churches uh, have done so much to hold the forth. But I think right now the opposition is becoming quite strong and more insistent. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of uh, related questions, uh, sort of logistical ones. Uh, one person asks, if African leaders refuse donated money tied to abortion funding in their country, will donors eventually stop trying? Uh, and then similarly, uh, another asks, if, if the majority do not want to use the abortion funds, could they be redirected where needed? Or is that naive or impossible to think that way? Could there be a reuse clause placed uh, in the, the distribution? Okay, so to answer the first question, can an African leader say, no, we don't want the money? Um, if you remember that small example I gave about a, a president that said no to condom funding, that was actually President Museveni of, of Uganda, is public knowledge, so people can easily check out what happened. No is the simple answer from just experience. Uh, these, it, once a leader, an African leader says, I don't want this. What we find is a, a level of personal attack and personal campaign that is almost unheard of or unreasonable that even you find there are African despots and authoritarians who constantly violate all kinds of human rights. Um, but once it comes to something like you know, refusing abortion money, the West, the West doesn't turn a blind eye. But every time the West turns a blind eye to presidents who wouldn't uh, come to, you know, who, who keep uh, staying in power and who refuse to give up power, who are rigging elections, who, who are doing all sorts of unbelievable things, nobody says anything. But then you, you say something about contraception and there will be a couple of news stories about you and about everything in your past. So a good example, recent one that has to do with contraception happened in Tanzania. A few years ago, the Tanzanian president specifically said, no more money from USAID for contraception. You need to go and read what happened because there were actually some specific news headlines about that man. And it, on, it all happened following him saying to women in his country, don't, you know, don't accept these contraceptives from the West and telling the Western countries, don't give us this money. Um, there was such a huge campaign, but even coincidentally, that man died two weeks ago. I mean, this happened like three or four years ago, but he died of COVID about two weeks ago. Uh, and he wasn't like, by the West. And I think the time he fell out with the West was just for refusing uh, contraceptive money. Uh, then asking about the second one, whether the money can be redirected, again, no. Um, it, it, they, it, this money is being pushed at the same time or together with a certain maneuvering. You know, that it's not just that they are generously giving us these millions of dollars to have this, that, and the other. It's that they give us the millions of dollars, but not really us. They give it to International Planned Parenthood Federation. So again, you get to see that paternalism or that kind of, we're dealing with a small child. So this is your money. We're gonna give it to Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood will use it on your behalf. So that is where the problem lies, that not only is it outrageous how this money is spent, but tax, Western uh, taxpayer money is often used to enrich some third party somewhere who is usually uh, Western. So it's someone sitting in London and he's on a six figure salary for doing some kind of abortion promotion in an African country. There's so much complexity in there, but I think that there is uh, much to be unpacked. And uh, uh, several on several occasions too, uh, we've had the opportunity to do so. If anyone wants to check out one of the recent uh, uh, interviews I did with uh, the Canadians, I think it's a Campaign Life Coalition, we did a one and a half hour uh, session where I had a very good discussion about how the Canadian money goes almost like money laundering in the name of section of reproductive health and rights. And that's on YouTube by Campaign Life Coalition. So I think they, call it, they called it Obsessed, uh, Canada's, um, uh, something about um, Canada's obsession with uh, reproductive rights or something like that. 
Thank you. Uh, I have a, a few people asking a, a question much like this. Uh, what can we, either Western activists or just we as individuals, do to, to help with Africa's battle against neocolonialism and to encourage our, our own fund, country to fund more important needs? There's actually a number of things you can do. So thank you for asking this. I'm always very excited to answer this particular question because people always ask, what can we do? There are all these problems being diagnosed, but what is the solution? As a Western taxpayer, you must know the one thing that you are actually the one paying for this inadvertently, without you meaning to, without you wanting to, even I've met people in the UK here who are very much in support of abortion, but they don't want their tax money being used for, you know, to, to you know, give to an abortion organization. They want more education and things like that. So as a taxpayer in the United States, uh, there are several things you can do. One, you, you can actually raise objections if you can organize maybe through an organization in the US or, you know, on your own or through your school or whatever channel you have, you can organize and approach the, the Congress, um, your House of Representatives, and complain on that level because even recently there have there have also been talks about, for example, making it permanent the situation with the Mexico City policy removal. They now want to make it even impossible for coming administrations to be able to, to tweak it. So you can approach your own legislators saying to them, this is what we've heard about Africa. You can take some of the data. Uh, if you've read uh, Target Africa, if, you, if you're someone who you know where to find me online, I can, give, I can give you some details, some specific things that you can use to make a case uh, and say, no, you don't want this. Um, you can also, on another level, you can uh, begin to question your, your agents the USAID, United States Agency for International Development, which is your government arm that actually then takes all this money and channels it and decides who to give it to, where to put it, um, how to go about it. A couple of years ago, USAID, using the American taxpayer dollars, uh, had done a really horrible ad, television ad, that they produced for the Kenyan audience, it was actually a condom ad. And what made it so offensive to the Kenyan audience was that this was a condom ad, a one minute ad, it was HD. So you could see it was a very expensive um, project, really beautiful video in a sense of speaking, but the message was so ugly. Uh, the women who were the subjects of this condom ad were married women who were being unfaithful in their marriage. So the whole message was, if you have to be unfaithful, you have to use a condom, you see. But what people, I I think the Kenyans were so angry at that message, you know, saying, how dare you imply that Kenyan women are unfaithful and this, that, and the other. But even what I found more outrageous than the actual ugly message was that at the end of it, you could see who paid for it. It's just the one second where they put the little logo at the end and it was paid for by the United States taxpayers and the United Kingdom taxpayers. Uh, so that would have cost them tons of, tons of money to do. You should approach USAID and tell them that some of these projects that you don't want them, their website, visit their website and see how they're allocating money. You can actually see how much they're giving to for example, to the population uh, programs, you can see things, the various projects that they're sponsoring, the good ones are good, so you leave them. The bad ones, you can actually object as taxpayers to say you don't want your money being used for these kinds of projects. And the church, of course, if, if, you, if uh, USCCB, since this is a Catholic audience, I always have to remember that if USCCB is willing to work with African uh, advocates and African leaders as well, that would be excellent. I've made several offers uh, for USCCB and you know people around the church, the Catholic church, especially in the US, if they are willing to work with myself or anybody else who is particularly working in Africa, I will be very, very uh, pleased and grateful to do that. But so far, nobody has taken that offer, so no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Those are really helpful ideas. Um, and the probably only time for one more question. And it, it's kind of the opposite, uh, asking you uh, for advice for us. Uh, so it goes, what advice can you offer to promote the culture of minimal acceptance of abortion uh, that, that you have? How can, can we, uh, as Americans or Westerners more generally, work to promote a culture of life like that? Yes. So for your own sake, I, I feel a little bad sometimes because it's, when I speak, it almost, it almost seems as if I, I have nothing <laughs> to say, you know, like 
and just me talking about how good Africa is. And then what about the people who are in these horrible, uh, play, you know, situations where there there is legal abortion and there's all of these things happening? Of course, the one thing that you need, you, everyone needs to realize is that all the things that I'm calling African culture and Africans are pro life and all that. If you think back, it's actually not African culture. We we don't have a patent to these cultures, um, but they used to be the universal culture of life, right? It's not the African culture that used to be at one point in time the universal culture right up until 1973 when your Supreme Court did what they did up until 1967 in the UK when the parliament did what it did and France 1975 and so on and so forth. So all these you know anybody who is living in a place where abortion is uh, legal and all that just stand back a little bit and look look have a have a stand back a bit and see a bigger picture that there was a time when a lot of people or majority of people were pro-life when people had this uh, view of life and, and there was the, the doctors were defending life and just claim back your culture reclaim back the moral voice that was at the root of your own culture is not even all that far back i mean i'm not talking about the medieval times i'm only talking about your mother's generation your grandmother's generation perhaps even you know when you yourself were younger we can always go back and reclaim and refuse to shift from the from that point you know and and from that confidence just gain that confidence that even though abortion is legal where you are even though there's all of these things that have been watered down uh, but what is your original tradition and culture definitely is what was before uh, so i think from that point we we can then begin to gradually win win our battles local and and um, and, and international, if you like, but I believe that the culture of life is inherent and, and it belongs to everybody before now. So we just have to keep pushing online or social media, read books, you know, get the right, um, uh, the, the right arguments and, and keep convincing your own self first and just be so very confident and convinced and then move from that point forward. Thank you. Thank you, that's great advice. And it is two o'clock, so I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, please note everyone that if you look in the, the chat, there are details about how to join session two, where uh, Uja won't be able to join us live because I, I think it's the middle of the night where she is by that time. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna have uh, her presentation again, if you wanna see it again, or please invite your, your friends to see it as well. And then there is going to be a live panel, including uh, our own Dr. Deborah Savage, uh, who is the director of the Siena Symposium. Uh, and so that begins at, at seven uh, central time. And again, the, the details about that are in the chat. Uh, and also please note that uh, this program has been recorded. Uh, and so there will be an announcement that the Murphy Institute will put out once the video is available. I can thank you so much for joining us, Uju, and uh, also thank you to the Murphy Institute and the Siena Symposium for sponsoring. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>